Hi everyone, uh, thank you for taking time out to attend today's talk. So today I'll be basically going through the, the 10 paintings from this series, uh, Deep and Law. So this, as most of you might have, have, have realized already, there are 10 paintings in this series and each painting features a specific three species. So Deep and Law is, is essentially about the stories that are related to these 10 tree species. And they are stories that have been uh, narrated through the ages from ancient times where you know these trees, some of these trees were sacred to the societies that, that um, revered them. So the stories take form in the form of uh, myths, legends, and folklore. And then um, there's a flow through this painting where it takes you through the ancient times to modern day. And the stories of the modern day is essentially about the challenges that uh, the trees and uh, nature in general uh, are facing due to uh, climate change, uh, habitat loss, uh, urbanization, pollution, etc. So essentially this whole series Deep and Law is about the ever-changing relationship mankind has with nature and they are embodied in the stories that are woven into the trees. So we, we begin the journey with the apple tree and um, I've also kind of attempted to represent different regions of the world in, in this series so there are trees from Africa, there are trees from Central and South America, Europe and of course Asia so you'll be moving through different regions of the world as we go through the paintings as well and we begin first of all with the apple tree so the interesting thing about the apple tree is it's, it actually originates from Asia but most of the stories that I have chosen to, to in, my, in my, the course of my research are largely from the European countries. So you will see myths that are related to the Nordic people and also to the Greeks. And also embedded within this apple tree is uh, fairy tales like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and also C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So, you, you might see, I've seen that, you might notice that you know, I have composed the apple tree in the form of the Uroboros, which is the world serpent that's eating its own tail. Because the, the stories that I have kind of collected and, and chosen to feature in, in this painting is essentially about human desire. And the tales are actually cautionary tales against um, giving in to human desire. Because the, the apple, interestingly enough, is often portrayed as the forbidden fruit. And indeed, in all the stories that are featured here, they, they, are, they are symbols of uh, forbidden fruit because the tales, for the most part, except for some of them, mostly end in tragedy. Especially the tales are from the Nordic peoples and also from the Greeks. Because they are essentially parables about you know, how if you are not disciplined and you give in to the, your, your carnal desires, that's when tragedy strikes. So. So, um, in that sense, that's where I begin because I feel like a, a lot of the stories that you see that are connected through, through this series, right, and also the, the predicament that, that nature is facing in relation to, to humankind, right, has a lot to do with the tragedy of um, the insatiability of human desire, which I will go into in further detail later on. Yeah. So, I will, not, I will not give you, I will not go into detail what, 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 what stories that I have picked from the, the, the Greek and Norse myths because there are quite a few embedded inside and it's a bit involved. But uh, of course, you know, the most recognizable, I would say, among all the symbols that are, that are, that are present in the, the painting, apart from the Google photos, is the Trojan horse. Yeah, and what many people, you know, it's, it's a very recognizable tale. And I've included it in because, you know, the cause of the Trojan War is in fact a golden apple. And that is because there was a banquet held in honour of the gods. And uh, there was one particular goddess who was left out of this banquet. And that is Eris, the goddess of discord. So, you know, she was very offended that, that she was not invited to this banquet. And, um, and true to her nature, because she's the god of discord, she decided to stir up trouble at the banquet. So what she did was she took a golden apple and inscribed on the word of uh, inscribed on the apple the, is the word palisade, which in Greek means the most beautiful. 
So she threw this apple into the midst of the banquet, and because it's addressed to the most beautiful, all the goddesses present at the banquet thought that it belonged, if they were, the, the apple should go to them. So they started, they started arguing who the apple should belong to, and chief among the, the contenders were, were Hera, the, goddess, the, the queen of the gods, uh, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. So naturally, the three of them refused to give way because they believed that they were the most beautiful. So in the end, they had to choose a neutral party, a mediator to decide among the three of them who was the most beautiful. And that person that they chose happens to be Paris, who is of course the, the main character in the Trojan War. So in the end, Paris chose Aphrodite as the most beautiful because Aphrodite promised him the love of the most beautiful woman on earth if he chose her as the most beautiful. And of course that's when the tragedy started because the most beautiful woman on earth at that point in time was Helen, but Helen was married. So you know, therein lies the tragedy of forbidden desire because you know, Paris and Helen fell in love but because of the fact that Helen is married that's why you know, this whole Trojan War started over, you know, just because of, of one golden apple and the desire for that one apple and then for the desire for a forbidden love. We have moved on to Central and South America and um, this painting is entitled Fruit of the Gods because uh, two civilizations, the Mayans and the Aztecs, believe that the cacao tree has uh, divine origins. So I kind of combined two different origin stories into the cacao painting. And uh, the first one, this head is kind of like a symbol of the Mayan origin story of the cacao tree. And uh, the Mayans believe that the cacao tree sprang from the head of the slain maize god. Now maize is a very important uh, staple in, in Mayan civilization. And it's so important to them that they believe that um, man was made, was, was, uh, uh, was created out of maize dough. So that was how important maize and subsequently the maize god was to the, the Mayans. So when the, the, when the maize god was slain in this, in this titanic god, among the, the gods, war among the gods, from the head and the corpse of the maize god sprang all the fruit bearing trees. And chief among the, the trees that were, were important was the cacao tree. And since you know it sprouted from the body of a god, that's why they believe that it is sacred. Now the Aztecs believe also that the cacao tree is sacred because it's a tree that is of divine origin. It grew originally in the heavens. And what happened and how it arrived to earth was because it was a gift from the feathered serpent god Quetzalcoatl. So Quetzalcoatl, he stole the cacao pods from the, the heavenly gardens and brought it down to earth and he taught mankind how to cultivate the, the cacao pods. And that's how, you know, the Aztecs believed that the cacao tree came to be on earth. So this is, this is why, you know, you see like this, the, the cacao tree, right, it springs from the head of the maize god and then it morphs into the feathered serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. But if you notice also, you know, if you look closely at the cacao pods, they're not doing well. Because embedded within this painting is also the story of the challenges of the cacao tree faces in modern day. Now the cacao tree is now very important to, to, to us, not because of its sacred origins, but because it's a very important commercial crop, because chocolate, which cacao is, which is made of cacao, is a very important uh, uh, commodity. So the cacao tree is now cultivated in regions outside its native lands of, of Central and South America. It's practically cultivated in all parts of the world where the climate allows for its cultivation. So it's now cultivated also in Africa, which is the largest exporter of cacao these days, and also in Southeast Asia. But unfortunately, humans are not the only, only things on this planet that love cacao. In every region where the cacao tree is cultivated, there is a specific pest that plagues the, the plantations. So in its native lands of Central and South America, there is this fungus known as the witch's broom. And at one time, it was, it was so serious, this infestation was so serious, it almost wiped out all the cacao plantations in Brazil. And in Africa, there is a virus known as the, the cocoa stolen shoot virus, which attacks the young shoots of the cacao tree. And then it, 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 
causes the, the, the shoots to swell up, wither and die. So you know, without the ability to regrow itself, regenerate itself, the cacao tree eventually also withers and dies. And in Southeast Asia, there is this moth known as the cocoa pot borer moth that likes to lay its eggs into the cacao pots while it's growing. So the larvae, when they hatch, they basically eat their way through the cacao pots from inside out. So these are all problems and pressures that the cacao tree faces in modern day. And on top of, on top of pest infestations, there's also the challenge of climate change. The warming weather is making it challenging for, for a cacao tree to survive because it's a tree that does not that requires actually partial shade to grow in. It cannot be exposed to full sunlight. But with the, the weather getting warmer and warmer, you know, the, the tree is often at risk of withering even in under partial sunlight. Yeah, so the altitude, in, the average altitude in which the cacao tree can grow in is gradually shifting upwards. But you know, it's there's a limit to how much you can do that because ultimately you run out of space to of, of, of space to, to go any higher. And of course, you know that reach a point that reaches a point at where it's simply too cold for the cacao tree to survive. So we now move to Africa and where the African baobab tree lives. Now the African baobab tree is one of the longest living trees in the world. It can live up to a thousand, two thousand years old. And um, it is very well adapted to the arid, dry plains of Africa. So what it does is it's a huge, the trunk itself is a huge water, water tank. And uh, the leaves are, are, are waxy and leathery so as to, to reduce moisture loss through the leaves. So it is a, a, a tree that is very well adapted to dry climates. But unfortunately, even the hardy baobab tree is finding it difficult to adapt to changes due to climate change. So scientists have discovered that, you know, trees that have lived for a thousand, two thousand years old, they are dying on mass recently because, you know, they simply, even, even in the hot, arid climate of Africa, it seems like climate change is a straw that finally, that has finally broken their backs. So which is why, right, I have kind of like, you know, composed this painting in, in the form of like a, an arc, like a post-apocalyptic scenario where, you know, we only have the last few oases of baba trees that are still clinging on to life uh, amidst the, the, the challenges faced from, from climate change. And this painting right also has, uh, I was also inspired the, the way I've composed this painting from uh, this very well-loved uh, tale called The Little Prince. So The Little Prince lives on this tiny asteroid. And there is a very specific ritual that he does every day without fail. And that is, he will, he will scour the asteroid and weed out all the baobab seedlings that he can find on the asteroid. And his reasoning for that is because the baobab tree can grow up to such a massive size, if the baobab tree is allowed to, to, to grow uninterrupted on the asteroid, its roots will eventually tear apart the asteroid. So it was a matter of a necessity for him that you know, he had to weed out these baobab seedlings because in order for everything else on the asteroid to survive, the baobab tree cannot be allowed to live. So he was amazed, you know, when he came to visit Earth, that the baobab trees could flourish on, on, on Earth because we know we have the land to support the baobab trees. But unfortunately, you know, even with, with such such endless plains in Africa, the baobab tree can no longer survive because the, the weather is simply too hospitable to its, you know, hospitable to its survival. Yeah. And on the side, you know, right, all the, all the animals that you see here, right, are all kind of related or dependent on the baobab tree for survival. So they, they, because the baobab tree, right, not only as a source of water, uh, available source of water, the, the leaves and the fruit are also rich in vitamins and, and essential minerals. So you know all the and the flowers are not are not pollinated by, by bees or, or butterflies. They are actually pollinated by fruit bats, which is why you see like you know, all these fruit bats hovering uh, around the bulb, the baobab tree. Yeah, and the flowers have long since you know, adapted to this very specific pollination system. So we now move to Europe, where we have the European ash tree and the European yew tree. Now these two trees are placed side by side because they kind of represent a two different sides of the same coin of life. There is the beginnings and there's an ending. 
So you know, in ancient cultures, especially where, where trees are venerated, there's always this concept of uh, the world tree, where the trees, the, where trees are literally what supports life on earth. So one of the most common symbols of the world tree can be found in Norse mythology in the form of Yggdrasil, the world tree. But Yggdrasil is not created, the, the, the concept of Yggdrasil is not created uh, out of thin air. There is actually a tree that they base Yggdrasil on and that is a European ash tree. Now you might notice that you know, it, 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 uh, it doesn't seem to quite fit you know, the, the image of what you would think a world tree should be because you know, if it's a supporter of all life, then it should be you know, tall, majestic and the canopy should be you know, full and, and vibrant and full of life. And uh, this is deliberate because um, its real life counterpart, the European ash tree, is also not doing well in, in modern times. And that is because of uh, a fungal disease called ash dieback. And, uh, so one of the problems, right, one of the challenges that, that uh, the natural environment is facing uh, due to globalization is also the introduction of, of pests that are not native to the, to the regions. So you know there are a lot of, of pests that are foreign to the lands that, that by and are carried over you know due to our uh, increasing accessibility. So what happens is the, the ash dieback, this fungus, is actually originally from Asia. So in Asia, where the ash trees in Asia have innate resistance to because they have they have to cope with this, this fungus over you know for, for millennia. You know, because they, they have kind of coexisted. So those ash trees in Asia are kind of developed, they have an innate resistance to the ash tree. But unfortunately, the European ash tree has no such resistance because it was never, it has never encountered this particular uh, fungus in, in, in Europe. So it has caused uh, uh, entire forests of ash trees to wither. And that's why you know you see in this painting, the canopy is bare and you see a lot of fallen leaves because the, the, the ash tree is wither. Now it almost seems as if um, the Nordic peoples are pre-science, you know, when in, in, in the stories that they tell of old. Because in in the tales of Yggdrasil, there is this particular mention when Yggdrasil, the world tree, starts to wither. It is a sign that Ragnarok, which is their version of Doomsday, is imminent. So you know, if you were to take that parallel right and to look at you know the signs that is happening around us, especially you know with this counterpart, the European ash tree withering, it almost seems like you know we are now seeing the signs of, of you know possibly our own version of Ragnarok in the form of climate change. Because if we don't do something very soon about, about all these changes and reducing the, the carbon debt, the car our carbon footprints, it's very likely that we'll see a runaway reaction in the the patterns and then you know we'll come to a stage where you know life becomes unrecognizable in the way we are familiar with. So you know with this all doom and gloom right, we come to this painting, the European yew tree, which is often associated with death and the afterlife. So I, I feel like you know this has largely to do with the toxicity that is inherent in the European yew tree. Every part of the yew European yew tree is poisonous except for the fruit, the red flesh that surrounds its seed. And that is probably because of necessity, you know, because you know it has to find some way to spread its seeds and that's how it attracts birds, you know, to, to, to feed on the fruit and then to, to scatter the seeds. Apart from that, right, every part of the tree is, is, is toxic. And so with this association with death, right, it's often found uh, very commonly grown in graveyards and also churchyards. Yeah, and it is, but at the same time, right, it is so important to, to, to the Germanic peoples, especially the Celts, that even in, in their language or in the runic alphabet, there is a rune that is devoted specifically to the yew tree. And this is the uh, Yuan's rune, which I've kind of, which I've engraved onto the yew tree. And you might notice, right, that, you know, clasped in the, the grass of the rune right, are uh, these clocks. Like if you look closely, the clocks right, are missing their clock candles. And this is because, you know, the mention that since you know it's associated with the afterlife, time has no hold in the afterlife. And that's why you know there is this idea that, that, that in the realm where the U tree represents, right, there is mortality no longer exists. Because you have 
pass the pass the threshold of, of, of humankind and gone on to the, another world, the afterworld. There are two trees that are situated in India. Those are first of all we will deal with the Indian sandalwood. So the Indian sandalwood right, is very well known for its trademark scent. And uh, it is an important tree to many religions, chief among them Hinduism, Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. So, so important is the Indian sandalwood to, to the Hindus that they believe that one of the most important goddesses in their pantheon, the goddess Lakshmi, actually resides in the Indian sandalwood tree. So I have included uh, uh, references to Lakshmi in, in, the, in the top part of the painting. So you will see these lotus garlands that devotees often present when they pay their respects to the goddess. And also we have her attendant elephants and the lotus mounts in the lotus pedestal that she sits upon and also her flying mount with the owl. And uh, for the owl, I have chosen a species that is native to India and that is a spotted owlet. Now you might notice that the composition of this painting is slightly different from the rest of the paintings that you have encountered so far in the sense that you don't actually see a tree. And that is because um, sandalwood, the Indian sandalwood is of course you know, not just a tree that is important spiritually, but it's also one of the most highly sought after tree commer trees commercially because of its trademark scent. And the harvesting of the, the Indian sandalwood is very destructive to the tree itself because um, in order to extract the, the sandalwood, the, the scent, the scent actually originates from the sandalwood oil, the essential oil that is found in not just the hardwood of the trunk of the tree, but it's also concentrated in its roots and also the branches. So in you know, order to minimize wastage and of course to maximize uh, uh, profit, when, when they harvest the tree, they basically uproot the entire tree. And once, once you know you harvest a tree, there's nothing left of the tree anymore. So, you know, in place of the tree, right, that's why I have chosen to represent the sandalwood tree in the form of a vial, because this is what you get right after processing the entire tree. One vial of sandalwood essential oil. And um, you see, you know, orbiting around the vial right, of sandalwood oil, uh, a plethora of perfume bottles, and that's why, and that's because, right, Sandalwood oil is highly popular in the fragrance and the cosmetic industries. And increasingly, it's also being highly sought after for its medicinal properties, especially in Ayurvedic medicine and also in traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah. So the next tree right, that we're moving on to is still, we're still in, in India, and uh, we're talking about a tree that is sacred to Buddhists, and that is the sacred fig tree. Now to Buddhists, the sacred fig tree has another name, and that is the Bodhi tree. But the Bodhi tree refers to a very specific sacred fig tree that is found in Bodhi Gaya, where Buddha gained enlightenment under. So while a Bodhi tree, the Bodhi tree is a sacred fig tree, not all sacred fig trees can be called the Bodhi tree, because the Bodhi tree is this very specific tree under which Buddha sat under. And the Bodhi tree can only be use this name the Bodhi tree can only be used for the original Bodhi tree and also the descendants of that Bodhi tree because the sacred fig tree can be cultivated by cuttings and cuttings of the original Bodhi tree has been collected over the ages and uh, they have been grown also and, and cultivated in different parts of the world in fact we in Singapore we have a Bodhi tree as well a descendant of that Bodhi tree in Bodhi Gaya and that tree I have visited, and that tree is situated in NTU. Yes. So, so it's a very, very, very little known fact, but yes, we do have a descendant of the Bodhi tree right here in Singapore. Yeah. And among all the paintings that, that are uh, uh, conceived, you know, in this series, the stories are basically, you know, collected from other sources. And this is perhaps the only painting where there is some sort of personal narrative, because I'm a Buddhist myself. So this in this painting, I have chosen to kind of meditate on my own personal, you know, growth as a Buddhist. Because um, the ultimate goal for all Buddhists, right, is to be enlightenment, which is represented, you know, in the Bodhi tree in the background and the Mahabodhi temple, which was built in honor of this event where, where and it's built beside the Bodhi tree, in, in commemoration of, of Buddha's enlightenment. So you will see, you know, in the foreground. That is this seedling, this Bodhi tree seedling that's growing among this tangled mess of, of roots. 
So it's kind of like a symbol of how I feel, you know, I have just only stepped foot on this path towards enlightenment and this goal you know, of Nirvana is very far away. And um, one of the, 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 the tenets of, of Buddhism you know, is, to, is to break away from attachment and to not give in to, to human desire because, you know, especially, you know, because human desire is insatiable and then we come back you know to the original concept that i mentioned very early on in the painting of the apple tree you know that the cautionary tales against uh, uh, giving in to your insatiable appetites and that is largely you know the the problems that many of the trees face these days right is in fact because of human greed you know the the indian sandalwood tree is endangered in india because of over exploitation and poaching illegal poaching and also, you know, the, in, in, in the case of the cacao tree, uh, there are pests that are related to it. And there are a lot of problems, you know, um, related to, to cacao plantations. Because, you know, when you build large-scale plantations, it also means that you are depriving other, other tree species of the, the ability to thrive. Because, you know, you have to clear out jungles, clear out forests in favor of growing these crops commercially. Yeah. And back to the Indian sandalwood tree, right? In fact, right, it's it's come to a point where Australia is poised to overtake India in terms of uh, Indian sandalwood production because they, they have devoted, you know, uh, these vast swaths of land, you know, in, in, in northwestern Australia solely to the cultivation of Indian sandalwood. So I kind of paired these two paintings together because I feel like you know they kind of represent this. This um, a symbol of, of, of the of this concept of yin and yang in, in, in Taoist philosophy. So the sakura tree to the Japanese, when the sakura tree blooms, is a huge event in, 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 in Japan. And you know they have this flower blooming festival called Hanami. And the Hanami is essentially a celebration of the fleeting beauty of, of life. Because the sakura blossoms only only last a few days before they wither and, and die off. So there is this whole idea, you know, that in, in Japanese culture, there's this whole appreciation for the fitting transience of life and you know the importance of living in the present and being present and living in the moment. And in contrast to that, we have the Huangshan pine, the Chinese pine, where in Chinese culture is a symbol of longevity, of endurance, and of, of uh, perseverance. Because the, the, the Chinese pine is able to, to thrive in very adverse environments, you know, very poor soil conditions, very harsh winds uh, in the mountains. So, and that's largely how, you know, it, they, they come to form such fantastical shapes because it's, it's literally sculpted by the weather that, that it has to deal with on a daily basis. The other thing you might know, right, that, you know, that is this that, that is almost like this, this sense of um, conscious composition in the sense that there is a very human aspect to the way the, the painting is constructed because the rock formations are not natural and um, I'm bringing in here, you know, in this concept, right uh, by referencing the traditional landscape paintings that are present both in the Japanese and the Chinese culture and that is because I want to bring in the idea of the, the, the idea of, of how we have over the ages sought to seek mastery over nature and even in our appreciation of nature we tend not to do it to, to leave it as it is we, we tend to try to shape nature you know, according to our aesthetic preferences so in both cultures right, there is this, this, this tradition of gardens in Japan there is the Zen gardens and in, 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 in China there is the, the concept of the rock gardens and in miniature forms we also see you know uh, the, the, the tradition of ikebana and also the tradition of bonsai so there's it's and this is a, a a phenomenon that is not unique to asian cultures we also get that a lot in western cultures this whole idea of the garden which is an idealized version of nature so we see a lot of formal gardens in, in villas and also in palaces you know, across europe as well so, 
And again, you know, this there's this whole the overarching theme of, of desire. In this case, right, the, the desire to seek mastery over nature. And, um, you know, in this painting, we finally, you know, after traveling across the world, we finally come back home because this is a painting about Singapore. And I've chosen to represent Singapore through the Angsana tree. Now, the, the interesting thing about the Angsana tree is that it's native to Southeast Asia, but it was not found in Singapore until the British introduced it to the island in the 1800s. And that was because they were building a lot of roads, you know, because they were like massively developing, rapidly developing the, the, the colony. And so the Angsana tree was introduced to Singapore because uh, it's an excellent shade tree, you know, because of its its widespread canopy and its rapid growth and also it's easy to plant them on mats and then they will provide shade at a very fast pace. So I, I found it very interesting, you know, that, that, that um, the history of the Angsana tree in Singapore is in fact very closely tied to the development of Singapore because, you know, for the, in both parts, you know, con modern Singapore, right, did not happen until the intervention of the British. And it's the same with the Angsana tree. It was not known in Singapore until the intervention of the British as well. The other thing, so Singapore, I feel like, is, is an interesting study of, of how we have to learn to coexist with nature, you know, the balancing the, pressure, the need for development with, with preserving what's left of our natural resources and what's left of our natural environment. And and also, you know, in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, as also in the history of Singapore, you know, there is this idea which Li Kuan Yew first brought up, the idea of the garden city, which you know, the idea, of the concept of garden, which I mentioned, you know, in the both the Sakura and the, in the Chinese fine painting. So you know, when Li Kuan Yew introduced this idea, right, he was primarily thinking about beautifying the city. So there is this idea right, of the tree being an ornament to the in the, in the urban landscape. But subsequently, we have transitioned to that, and then you know that the, when the Singapore Green Plan came about, then you know there was this idea of Singapore being uh, a city in a garden. So there is this emphasis now, right, that that um, that um, we need to build more green spaces because they are not just important as as ornaments; they are also important as green spaces, as breathing spaces, because it's essential for for our health as well. And now. Moving forward, you know, in the Singapore Green Plan 2030, there is this now this this shift, you know, to, to Singapore being a city in nature, and I think this is a very important step because it's recognition that that um, our relationship for trees, you know, which has changed radically from ancient times where we used to revere trees because they were sacred to us, and then subsequently in with the advent of industrialization, the trees were relegated to being commodities as resources that we exploit for our own development. But now, you know, increasingly, right, we have to recognize that it is a symbiotic relationship that we have with trees and, and, and with the natural environment at large because nature can survive without us, but we certainly cannot survive without nature because, you know, first of all, right, all, all our resources are derived from nature. And one of the things, right, that that, that the, one of the recurring problems in, in our current model of economic growth is this assumption that you know the economy needs to grow year on year in order for 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 things to be healthy. But in order for the economy to grow year on year, it also means that we need to keep increasing our consumption. And that is and, and that is based on the assumption that we have unlimited resources which we clearly do not have because you know Earth is only so big, and the amount of resources right we have right is only this much. So this this model of growth is is fundamentally flawed, and so you know there is this whole now shift towards uh, sustainable development, which I think you know Singapore is, is actively trying to recognize. You know especially with the green plan that you know we need to now shift towards you know this idea that we need to coexist with nature instead of us being masters of nature. Yeah. And you will see here, right, there is this part where, yes, there is the manicured aspect of nature because you know, now, now that we've come to a part where most parts of the world, right, is essentially 
uh, urban habitats instead of you know instead of the past where it's mostly natural. So you know we cannot escape this whole part about that that, that is for the most part, especially in the in the city, the nature that exists in the city, right, is a manicured version. But likewise, right, because we are the ones that are responsible for changing this landscape, we need to also take charge, right, and also there is this potential for us to reverse the damage we have done. And that has to come from science and research. So the Amsana tree then becomes a very important symbol of that. Because um, what happened is the Angsana tree in the 80s and the 90s also fell prey to a fungus that swept in from Malaysia. And um, at the peak of this fungal plague, there was at least on average one Angsana tree dying every day. So a lot of Angsana trees were culled. And among them right, were these five iconic Angsana trees at the Esplanade Park. And uh, in Hokkien, they were called Gozan Chiuka which literally translates into the five Angsana trees. So, it, so they, were, they were a landmark for, for, for dating couples in the 60s and 70s because you know, before the, the age of, 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 of mobile tech communication. So you know, they had to do it old school and then um, they, were, they, were, they were always the best name. Okay, there's this landmark that we can meet under. So this was a landmark for dating couples. And unfortunately, in the 90s, these five iconic Amazon trees were cut down because they fell, they fell victim to this fungal plague. So what NPARCs had to subsequently to do was to do research and come out with cultivars that were resistant to this fungus. So recently, they have come out with a, a fungus-resistant uh, strain of the Amazon tree and they have since replanted the five Amazon trees. So if you look carefully right in the veins of the Asana tree, of the, of the fruit of the Asana that I have drawn here, right, you can see like five trees sprouting out from the base. And that is a reference to the five Asana trees that have since been replanted at, at, the, at the original spot in the Estimate Park. So you know, amidst all the doom and gloom that I kind of highlighted in the series, I also wanted to you know, plant a seed of hope that you know it's not it's not too late to do something about it. Yeah. We make the mess, but we can also clean up the mess. And that is something that is, is I feel like we, we need to do in order not just for the survival of the tree, but also for our own survival.